our second edition of um, Just Birth. Our um, chat that we're going to have today is about reflections on Black Lives Matter movement um, and how that affects birth work. We have with us today Desiree, and Desiree Wills is the owner and operator of the fourth trimester doula. In addition to being a postpartum doula that is certified with Doula Canada, uh, Desiree is a wife, a mother to two teen boys, a dog mom to two rescue dogs. She's also experienced as a late diagnosis of postpartum depression after her second child and deeply understands all of the trials and tribulations of parenthood, particularly during the fourth trimester. We also have Gabrielle, um, and Gabrielle Griffiths is a full spectrum doula, educator, pub and public speaker. Gabrielle works through trauma-informed and an anti-oppressive lens to help families have a healthy and happy transition into parenthood that is sex positive and inclusive to all gender and sexual identities. Gabrielle is a polyamorous and queer identified parent who lives proudly with all of their intersecting identities in Toronto, Ontario. And Kara, Kara is an intersectional feminist with a passion for healthy equity. This passion motivated her to pursue a career in health research and policy, focusing on projects that address and alleviate adverse social determinants of health. Most recently, Kara is the EDI lead racialized communities and social media, social media coordinator at Doula Canada. She is also a student in the Triple Stream program. So let's get started. Um, and I'll start kind of the, the discussion by asking you guys this question. When you first started hearing the, the phrase Black Lives Matter, what was your reaction? Kara, would you like to go first? Uh, yeah, uh, so yeah, that we started hearing this phrase a lot, I think around 2012, uh, and it was interesting because obviously it was interesting to me that we needed to assert this when it's such a basic statement of fact, um, but it hit home for me that it really sort of crystallized a lot of what I have felt as a Black woman living in this society um, my whole life that like you really do have this feeling as you navigate a ton of situations that you are being treated as less of a person than other people and as though your life doesn't matter. So it really hit home for me that this was not just a feeling that I was having on some level or not an exaggeration of the actual plight of Black folks in society that we were all thinking this on some level and now we were all saying it out loud. <coughs> But the other thing that was interesting to me in terms of my initial reaction to BLM was the amount of backlash, the amount, the extent to which people got offended by hearing that phrase, um, the amount of people who really needed to repudiate that statement with the, the all lives matter clapback, right, where it really exposed the fact that like, it's so sad that black folks on mass feel the need to say this at all. And even though it's such a basic statement of fact, it's not being received that way. It's being received as something that like people in certain quarters of society are really getting offended by and their backs are getting up to it, even though it should be like, well, of course. Um, so I think that it really brought a lot home for me as to exactly how much racism is below the surface in our society and the kind of conversation that needs to start happening to address it. Thank you. Um, Gabrielle? Yeah, thank you for sharing all that. I feel like very much, very much similar. Like when I first started hearing it, it wasn't, it, it, I don't know. It's just like, I already know all those things, right? So it wasn't really revolutionary. I'm just like, oh, a little bit of humanization for my community, that's nice. But again, it's coming from my community. It's, it's, a, it's almost, and maybe this is the most positive light, but honestly, it's, it's a little bit heartbreaking when I think about like, we're still talking about Black Lives Matter. Like that's just the bare minimum, right? And I think mm -hmm. about all the issues that we experience on an ongoing basis. And even more so when you add in multiple intersections, you know, myself, I'm like, I'm a queer 
black femme, you know, it's a different way that I'm going to experience the world. Um, and so I'm, I'm at the point where I'm like over it. I want to talk like, of course we matter. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right. Let's talk about like something else. Something it would be lovely to be able to be at a place our, of having push a- ourselves forward. Yeah. Um, yes. I know. I want to have the conversation of like, how can we be equal participants in society? Not like, how can we matter on a basic level? But it's just like, it really exposed that like, oh, apparently we do need to have a conversation about the fact that we matter on a basic level. Yeah. So I know, I know for me, it was <clears throat> when I first heard about it, it felt like more of the same, nothing um, surprising, like, like both of them said, nothing surprising, nothing new. Um, I didn't even really need to dig that deep to get an understanding of what that movement was about, because there were variations of the, that movement for how many years and centuries going on and on. Um, it feels like, again, more of the same. Everything that they are, that they stand for, that they're fighting for, I, it's still the same things that I was fighting for when I went to York University. There was actually a protest in, I don't, I'm not going to reveal the year, but it was a lot, long time ago. Um, <clears throat> we actually had to stage a protest because um, Blacks were being targeted on campus and, and being mm-hmm. asked to show um, identification. And it was consistent over and over again, amongst a lot of other problems on campus. So um, what has changed? Absolutely nothing. So it wasn't surprising. I actually, at the time I was working in the corporate environment, I actually had someone very casually at lunchtime saying, hey, Desiree, what do you think about the Black Lives Matter movement? And it's like, okay, this is not just a casual conversation. This is much, much deeper than you could possibly imagine. And quite Mm -hmm. frankly, I'm not comfortable talking to you about it because sometimes people approach you to talk to you about these things, not to actually learn, but to actually defend or Mm -hmm. just feel more firm in their position on what they think about it. They're not interested in learning. So um, in that particular case, that person revealed that they were open to it. And I, over a course of, I don't know, like to this day, I still talk to her. The conversation is continuous and ongoing and she is open to it. So it was a little bit different, but it's just, uh, just more of the same more of the same, nothing surprising. Um, I would just add to that, that I feel like for me, what was, cause you're right, the conversation in my family and black communities has not changed this entire time, as long as I've been alive. I also did my undergrad at York. We were having the exact same conversations as when you were a student there, like nothing has changed. Like nothing has changed and we're frustrated. I feel like what was different at the start of 2012, like I got my first smartphone in 2012, a couple of weeks before my son was born. Um, And I know that a lot of people were getting smartphones at around the same time. And this is when we started, because like a huge linchpin of the BLM movement is about looking at police brutality as like a really overt example of the systemic violence um, that Black folks face. And I think it's really important to bring it back to an overt example. It's not by any means the extent of the the kind of social violence that we face as Black people. But whereas before the early 2010s, like around this time, when you tried to talk to, you know, as Desiree was saying, a lot of people's knee-jerk reaction when Black folks try to talk about their oppression is to get defensive. So conversations that I would have with people about police brutality is a phenomenon that we experienced before the BLM movement would be like, well, how do you know that race was why this person was treated this way? Maybe they actually did something wrong. Maybe the cop legitimately did fear for his life, Mm -hmm. right? So you would have to deal with all of those issues as you were trying to talk about like the trauma that our community has been facing for generations. And then people started to have cell phone footage of how these interactions were actually going. And it started, and it's not that there isn't still pushback, but it started to become a lot harder for people to clap back. So I don't know that the BLM movement has changed anything 
for Black people. Like we understand our situation in the same way, but I think it's very much entwined with us now being in a position to have more evidence of what the social situation is and then being able to galvanize a movement that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and a lot of the focus of the Black Lives Movement has been on interactions with the police, Um, but there's also ample evidence to show that anti-Blackness shows up often in healthcare. So I wanna talk a little bit about how this movement has impacted your interactions with the healthcare system, whether that's as a birth worker or whether that's been as a patient in the healthcare system. Mm, I'm really curious to hear others' thoughts on this because, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, for me personally, I think it opened my eyes a little bit um, because I'm, Looking back, there were interactions that I've had that you get an inkling um, that it's because I'm Black, but you can't really pin it down. Um, There's this instinct, internal instinct that I usually have. And again, it's not, there's nothing scientific about it. It's just something you just feel in your core. When I meet somebody for the first time, I could tell if they see me as a Black person or if they just see me. Mm-hmm. And it's, and I'm glad you guys are saying yes, because it's, mm-hmm. I, I, it's so not true. something you can really quantify, but you just know it God, then, yeah. you as black first, more than anything else. Um, and I had a really negative um, um, experience postpartum after my second son. This is even before I had a uh, uh, diagnosed with postpartum depression and looking back at it now, I'm realize, wait, maybe they were being that harsh because I was Black. Um, Now, I do find that um, when you first see me, and I also look fairly young for my age, so when they first see me, they see me as young Black female, and until they actually hear me talk, then they realize, oh, well, she's not... she's articulate she's um you know she can speak up for herself she knows the system um so then there's a shift depending on who I talk to um but I think my approach now personally um is more assertive so I even in the last month I had an appointment with the doctor regarding something that was going on that wasn't wasn't major but it's something that's been going on for years that I've been putting on the back burner And when I had the appointment, the first thing I said is, I need you to take this seriously. Um, I know it sounds very whatever, wishy-washy, but this is serious and I need you to do everything that you need to do to investigate this because it's something that I've been dealing with for a long time. So um, thankfully the doctor that I had, she's really amazing and she did take it very seriously and was able to, to, get to a resolution, but my approach has definitely changed. My approach is much more, I wouldn't say aggressive, but definitely more assertive. I definitely ask more questions. I don't take an answer for what it is. um, And I'm more likely to ask for a second opinion on things. Mm -hmm. Now, knowing what I know. Um, In the past, I don't think I would have done that. I think I just accepted that the system works as it works and it is what it is, but I don't believe Mm -hmm. that anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that sounds so like that resonates for me so much. Um, Yeah, I feel like, again, like it's not so much that I didn't realize that like anti-Black racism was real, real, as as Desiree described. It's a gut instinct that we have all had, like for as long as we can remember, like from the time we were tiny children, like we can sense how people are reacting to us. Um, So none of that change, including in terms of how that operates in healthcare interactions. But what happened after 2012, and BLM was a phrase that was in everyone's mouth, is that I got a lot harder to gaslight, right? Because as I, back to my point about having that evidence, and that like continuously for many generations, you know, our experiences when we try to talk about what our oppression looks like, it's like, well, prove it. (laughs) Prove that this is really what's happening. Right. It got a lot harder for people to clap back with that, I feel, once BLM started and a lot easier for me to be like, yeah, no, I'm actually not having that. Like, 
I can't be gaslit around this stuff now. I actually know that this is real. For me, BLM was happening, like it was sort of becoming big right as I was starting my master's degree in health research um, and very like going into it, very interested in these kinds of health equity issues and like learning about social determinants of health and really seeing that like, oh, it's not just that people have like smartphone video now to demonstrate the police brutality, there's growing research evidence to show the disparities we're experiencing in other settings as well, right? So, you know, for example, the Black maternal mortality research that's come out over the last few years has been huge. And I'm not even really sure there would have been a political or academic will to even create some of that research that we've seen in the last few years had it not been from the momentum of the Black Lives Matter movement, getting everyone to essentially be forced to acknowledge that racism is real, anti-Black racism is real and specific within the context of racism, right? So like, it wasn't just the recognition, recognition that racism is real and that it's happening, but that it's happening to Black people in ways that are really unique to our experience. Um, and that we all need to start having a conversation about, right, and how that looks different. So I see a lot of changes in terms of, so even just in terms of when, when I was in school and talking to classmates or bringing these issues up in a class, you know, the amount of pushback I got trying to talk about these things in undergrad or during my first master's degree, which wasn't as focused on these kinds of issues, you know, like it was just continuously meeting with this defensive reaction of like, you're wrong, it's not really happening. I know I treat everybody equally. This society has lost, like it was just people continuously crack, clapping back with things that denied your experience. And I feel like that denial has gotten a lot harder for people to do. And conversely, like we as a black community are like putting up with it a lot less. And I just, I just remembered one thing. I, um, with a, a particular client, now she wasn't Black. Um, she's of Indian descent, and she does have a very slight accent. Um, I, I was her, her postpartum doula, and I was making arrangements for her to go to a breastfeeding clinic. So I called the clinic. I made the appointment. They were absolutely wonderful. Now, if you don't see me, this is all over the phone. If you don't see me, right, the way I talk, um, and I know how to talk to professionals, et cetera. So when she ended up calling the clinic, they were incredibly rude to her. They wouldn't let her finish a sentence. She was trying to ask questions and they were cutting her off and um, weren't listening to her concerns. And when she told me this, I was like, what? And then immediately I wait, it's her, it's her accent. It's her mm -hmm. accent. They're immediately disrespect and, and dismiss. And I see it on, on a regular basis. So imagine that they're just doing that based on accent alone. They, mm. they did not see me. They don't know I'm Black. And even if they did see me, they would first see me as Black until I opened my mouth and realized, mm. wait, you, you, can't, you can't mess with this one because she knows what she's talking about. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's very, and I didn't say that to the client, but I just immediately knew why they were mistreating her. And it's, it's yeah. very sad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, I feel like I'm not, like, I'm kind of where you're at, where I'm like, if I think this is what's happening, it's, it's what's happening, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Yeah, whereas this society really leads us yes. to second guess ourselves in these right. interactions, right? And like, that's probably what's happening because it's built into the system. Yes, exactly. Right? Like that's it's what's supposed to happen. It's been taught mm -hmm. for all these years mm -hmm. to not look at us as human. Mm -hmm. So like, I'm thinking about the question, like, how has the movement impacted your interactions? Like, it's, it's such a hard thing to, to talk about because we're talking about the humanization of Black people. And even to say that sentence is so heavy because why are we even talking about that? Mm -hmm. But that's what we're talking about, right? Um, and of course, you know, racism has impacts of, of all other races, but today we're talking about Black folks and like hearing new folks talk about 2012 is 
interesting. That's why I've just been sitting here kind of taking it in because I, I was graduating high school in 2012. So I was like barely conscious as a teenager. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I mean, I mean and so like, like, I remember hearing it the first time and I'm just like, that's dumb. Like, of course. And it's like exhausting. I, I, I almost more often feel bad for, for the, for my fellow community and folks that have been advocating for our humanization for the last fucking oh i'm so sorry for forever <laughs> um like 500 years for, for <laughs> five forever, 600 years you yeah. know and so we had to for me black lives matter is like the the marketed version of hello we are human right we've been saying mm. this for the last 500 50 100 million years we mm. we matter on the most basic of, of level and it's taken we're here into 2020 and i make a joke sometimes that 2020 was the awakening of racism suddenly everybody and their cousin is like oh, the racism yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. i me you know, we and it's like yes yeah. we've been saying this yes well and how appalling that it took a man literally being like murdered in the street in broad daylight you know like in an incredibly violent matter <laughs> for people to be like oh, okay i guess we can't deny the problem anymore you know and i feel like yeah it's it's that piece where we're not going to allow people to deny the problem anymore. we have to get past that because we need to get on to solving the problem and you can't if every time you try to talk about the problem you're going to be met with denial so now there's like I think much more of a pathway to talk about how this dehumanization shows up in healthcare, right? So we know, for example, with the the disparities in um, black maternal mortality, one of this, one of the factors that drives this is providers not believing what patients are telling them about their experience of pain. There's an assumption that like black people don't feel pain at the same level. And it's an it's assumption that a surprising number of healthcare providers have endorsed explicitly in health research that's out there now showing this, right? So I feel like all of these shifts have made it a lot more possible for us as doulas and as patients ourselves to A, recognize these things that we're seeing, right? So Desiree, you were talking about for you when you saw your client experiencing this discrimination. Firstly, the recognition happened more quickly. And then secondly, you didn't guess yourself, second guess yourself out of that recognition. Like you were like, yeah, this is definitely what's happening. Mm -hmm. That's a huge shift in our state of mind. I think that we need to kind of take a pause to acknowledge that that's kind of a big gift we've been handed, right? Because now if I'm at a birth and I see my patient saying that they really need the epidural, even though that's not what was on the birth plan, and I see pushback happening. I have a much better framework for understanding what's happening there. I have a much better framework for preparing clients for this kind of scenario in the health, so that they're more prepared for the kind of self-advocacy that might need to happen. And I feel like I have a much better rubric for calling out the provider, right? And like recognizing that I have a certain degree of privilege as Desiree spoke to in terms of being educated and middle-class and being able to present those ways, like the code switching that we do very organically in our lives as black people, like we know, what the rules of engagement are in a conversation within our own community. And we know what the rules of engagement are when we need to navigate situations with people like nurses and doctors and midwives <coughs> and the kind of authority that they bring to the table where like the authority of their professions is so rooted in the systems of colonization and like the power that's derived from that. So as Gab was saying that like, when the system is racist, it's not an aberration. It's not, it's not a bug in the system. It's, right. it's a design feature. Right. Um, so I feel like there's a much clearer pathway to really challenging that. Like, I feel like I would feel much more entitled to say to a provider, hey, are you aware that this happens routinely in healthcare interactions with how Black women's pain is perceived? Have you informed yourself? Are you actually taking that into consideration in your interactions with Black clients? Like, I feel like the information is out there and somebody trying to gaslight me now when I bring that, I'm going to be like, no, forget that. Bam. Like, here's my stack of articles that shows that this is what's actually happening. 
Mm -hmm. So you know what's interesting, Kira? Um, it's it sounds like you would be prepared to challenge um, whoever the healthcare professional is at the time. It's interesting. I don't think I'm at that point yet. Mm. It would have to be very extreme in my face. I don't when I when I say I'm not ready to do that. I don't think I would call it out. Mm. I would just navigate around it. Yeah, me too. Yeah, um, it's, it's really tricky interesting that I wouldn't call it out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. It's so tricky because I've only been at a few births so far. Like I'm very new in my career as a doula and you're right because like the, the safety and the well-being of that person who's laboring, giving birth is what's paramount and creating drama in their healthcare act interaction, particularly creating drama that causes me to be told to like leave the situation. And now they don't have my support at all. That's not helpful. <laughs> right. So the times that I've like seen things crop up, it's been subtle and the way that I've had to disrupt it has been equally subtle, right? So for example, I ended up doing emergency postpartum support for an African client through, so uh, Gabrielle and I um, both work, uh, we're both members at Okama Collective, which is a nonprofit doula collective based in Toronto of BIPOC doulas supporting BIPOC families. So I was supporting um, a black African client um, who was being discharged from the hospital and she was being discharged late at night, post-surgical um, and she needed a bunch of medications at discharge time. The client was uninsured. I knew she was gonna have to pay for these medications out, out of pocket and it's late, right? So because I've lived here my whole life and again, it's the different privileges that we bring to the situation. I'm always thinking about how can I share the privilege that I have in this situation with the client. So she obviously didn't know that the hospital has it within their power to send people home with at maybe a day's worth of medication at discharge to tie them over. The hospital's not going to tell you that that's within their power to do because they're not going to just give out potentially hundreds of bucks worth of meds for free unless you ask, right? So I wasn't gonna sit there and like see them turn this person out of the hospital late in the evening. We're like, what, now they've gotta go do some pharmacy coordination instead of going home and recovering with their baby. I was just like, uh, so, you know, all I said to the nurse is she was explaining the discharge and like, these are the medications you need. These are the ones you're gonna take tonight when you get home. I was just like, so you can discharge her with like a day's supply of these medications, right? And like, I didn't say it in a way that was confrontational, challenging her, like, why aren't you providing, offering to provide her with this resource that I know that you have the power to do? I was mostly just like, so you're doing this, right? And she was just like, yeah, we're doing this, right. <laughs> you know, because like, right. right? So it's like, I feel like when we hear advocacy, we think that it always has to happen in this confrontational, right. aggressive way. And sometimes it's as simple as... So you guys have a taxi chit booklet, right? For sending people home for free if they need that service, right? Like it, you know, like, and it wasn't confrontational. I wasn't going to get thrown out of the hospital for saying it, but she got the resources that she needed that I knew were there. And to, you know, I know that a lot of what we're taught is about promoting the client's self-advocacy, but in that situation, like this was a client I was meeting for the first time, like as she was being discharged from the hospital, there hadn't been an opportunity to talk through these things beforehand. And this person is a, a newcomer. Like the reason why I know that the hospital can do this is because I've lived here my whole life and I've been in the hospital myself, so I've supported family member. Like I know that this is something that they can do, but I also know it's something that they won't offer to do, right? right? So I had to say something. Like to me, there was no choice ethically, like... You know, I knew they could do it. All I had to do was speak up. Right. And it, there's there's been a lot of um, uh, interest in the news, and Kira, you've touched on it a lot. But there's been a lot of attention recently about Black maternal mortality and anti-Black racism, and it is an issue for Black birthing people. And so I wonder how you guys feel and and what you guys see the care system would be in a Black Lives Matter, a, a true Black Lives Matter system, and how that would differ from the way the system is now. Mm. You're, you're all not I don't know have the right words to, to kind of express how you, how you would see it. Yeah, because it's it's complicated. 
it's it's not a simple answer. It's not a straightforward answer. It's it's almost like just completely dismantling the system of racism. Mm. Essentially, is what it's going to take, yeah. and that is not something that's going to happen overnight. Unfortunately, mm. um, it's just because the Black Lives Matter movement has made a lot of of headway doesn't mean things have changed. Um, mm. I have a, a lot of, of white friends who are, are actually putting in the work um, mm-hmm. to make sure that their environment, their, their schools, their kids are not growing up the way that they did in terms of how they, they view the world. And every once in a while, um, one of them might say to me, so like, are things getting better? Are things changing? And it's like, that's not how it's going to work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not like we're going to see dramatic, like, um, it's like such, it's almost yeah. kind of like you have to almost think of it as like geological time. Right? Yes. Like things are like, I guess if I, if I want to borrow from ideas that exist within indigenous teachings, right. It's that like seven generations back. Yes. seven generations forward thing where it's like it's almost like we have to have faith that the things that we're doing that like move the needle however in- incrementally it moves the needle are a benefit um in terms of the concrete things that i've seen that i think have the potential to be benefit be of benefit um i think that all healthcare pro- providers like regardless of what your healthcare sector is i don't care if you're anyone from a doctor to a chiropractor to a naturopath to whoever you are to a doula to whoever you are in the healthcare system if you're working with people's health and well-being you have an obligation to recognize implicit bias mm-hmm. you have an obligation to recognize that implicit bias is real in the world but also to acknowledge that it's real inside yourself right and that's true for all of us it's true for me on an internalized level with blackness, but it's also true for me on all of the axes of oppression where I experience privilege, right? So just because I'm a black woman doesn't mean, and a queer black woman, it doesn't mean I'm above being classist. It doesn't mean I'm above being transphobic. It doesn't mean that I'm above enacting any of these behaviors in ways that are just flying under the radar for me because it's not my lived experience. So that means having the openness when somebody says to me like, yo, that wasn't cool. Like, you know, here's what you're saying is rooted in. It's about resisting the temptation to meet that with defensiveness and like respond with openness. Take it, like I say this to people a lot, like whether it's about like race or whatever the issue is, take it as a gift. If somebody is bringing this feedback to you and giving you an opportunity to learn. Um, So yeah, I feel like just being aware of the reality of implicit bias, and it's like, you're not going to be like, okay, I understand that implicit bias is real, it exists in me, and tomorrow I'm free of implicit bias. Right. If you understand implicit bias, you recognize that you're never going to be free from implicit bias, so always be humble, right? Um, That's sort of what I would say, like, to me, it's a state of mind thing that needs to happen now, because I feel like in a lot of the, the work that I did as an activist and the conversations that I had with people in my earlier life. There was a lot of people being like, well, we have a human rights code. We have laws that say that people have to get paid the same for the same work. And like, you know, all of these systems in place. And it's like, well, if people's hearts and minds haven't changed, that's not going to do anything, right? Like a lot of these laws that people point to have been in place for a while. Like we're not... Yeah, like, I can say that we black folks are not feeling the impacts of these. That's things, right. right. Not just that it hasn't helped. Like I appreciate that. Like I'm a highly educated person in the society, and like a hundred years ago, that wouldn't have been possible. So of course things have shifted, but I also am aware that like I got access to what I got access to for reasons, for reasons that are rooted in the same kind of unearned privilege that I'm against. So to me, that's why like I always lead with being intersectional and like that whole system of oppression needs to collapse for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. And, and to, to further what Kira said just about there's, there's systems, there's laws, there's the, the, codes and everything but I remember having to explain to someone because they they were of the mindset that if you are getting in trouble with the cops you must have been doing something wrong so it's I had to explain that even if we follow all the rules and do all the right things I cannot tell you how many professional male black men are still getting pulled over by the cops Mm -hmm. um and 
it you can go to school, study hard, get good grades, graduate university, get a good job, buy a house. It yeah. doesn't matter. Follow the rules. You're still a target, no matter yeah. what. It can evaporate over. I mean, look at. I mean, I think when Sandra Bland happened, right? Yeah. Because we've, I think, also assumed that Black women are safer from this kind of targeting than men in our communities are. And then that kind of just reset the bar, right? Like she had all of those points going for her that we point to. Um, I don't know why her name is escaping me because it was on everyone's lips two years ago. Um, But the young woman who's a paramedic who got shot to death by the police asleep in her own apartment, you know, like, you know, like it's just like, we need to recognize that there is a big problem happening here that isn't about what this particular individual was doing, where they were, where they were going, who they were talking to. Like, this is very universal. Bringing it back to birth issues, like Beyonce has had to talk about the experiences that she had as a birthing person. Serena Williams has had to talk about the experiences that she's had where she nearly died because of of the kinds of issues that we've been talking about. So yeah, I agree 100%. Like, affluence, education, all the things that are, are, you know, my parents were very entrenched in respectability politics and like getting an education, having careers, how to beat this. And I think that my generation now is seeing, well, that's kind of not all there is to it, you know? Yeah, yeah. Like there is, like, it's so complex and I appreciate both of your shares because I feel like you expressed it really well on a lot of key points. Like there's, it's, so hard to change the perinatal care system alone when you know people go to the educational institutions to learn how to work Mm -hmm. in this field and that's rooted in in racism and um then you go into the system that's like exploitive at core the foundation of it is exploitive we think about the foundation i don't even like wording it like that the foundation of of obstetrics and the history of that is an exploitive system rooted mm-hmm. in racism. So we mm-hmm. want to change the system that requires us to actually look at the impacts of white supremacy. We keep talking mm-hmm. about anti-blackness, anti-blackness. We need to be talking about the impacts of whiteness. Mm-hmm. That's what we need to be talking mm-hmm. about. That's what 100%. I want to be having conversations about: the impacts mm-hmm. of whiteness on the perinatal care system. Mm-hmm. 100%. That's so important, right? Because it's like everybody wants to think, like nobody wants to use the word white supremacy because it's like an ugly phrase. It has connotations that aren't meaningful in the lives of, of Black people. But it, you're right. The only reason why Black Lives Matter is necessary is because of systemic white supremacy. It's a response to that. Yeah. And it's almost kind of like systemic white supremacy is the, is the Bruno here for those who have seen Encanto. It's like the Bruno in the situation that nobody wants to talk about. It's like, we yeah. need to talk. And nothing <laughs> will change in the system until we start talking about it. And not mm-hmm. only in the educational institution, not only in the healthcare spaces, but also in the home with yourself. Like yes. here I was saying, like, the implicit bias for me is bare minimum. It is bare minimum for you to humble yourself and acknowledge that you're going to have a preconceived thought about something because we live in a society where we're bombarded with media. We're told all these things based on our cultures and the people you hang out with. You're going to have an opinion on something. Just be open to understand that it might be problematic. (laughs) It might be Mm -hmm. harmful. Yeah, You know, and people feel uncomfortable talking about whiteness, but you know, what's uncomfortable is experiencing racism, just walking Mm -hmm. into a room and knowing that it doesn't matter what I say, you see me as a black, Mm -hmm. not even adding person at the end, because you don't see me as a person. Yeah. No, that's for sure. I know for, I, there's only so much that I can do as someone that works in the healthcare field to impact the change in the system because I don't have the same keep or like access to wield the power that some other people do Mm -hmm. you know like we're we're all talking and acknowledging our own privileges here Mm -hmm. as three black individuals and and that again is is another bare minimum just acknowledging the tools you have in your bag you know what when I walk in a room this is what I can do 
And the individual yeah. either chooses to wield it or they don't. Yeah. There's a lot of people with a lot of power that don't wield it. Yes. And instead mm -hmm. play victim and say, but, 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 but. And so like, if we're gonna be talking about changing systems, it's so individual. And it like, I just, I can't see it being possible without completely eradicating very big parts of it. Mm -hmm. right? Literally people yeah. need to be fired. People need to leave. People need to go away. Like, <laughs> And, and allow new folks to come in and to sit and listen, like mm -hmm. put, we'll put our listening ears on for a change. Yeah. We've been saying the same things for the last 50 years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You will read and listen to any activist over the last hundred years. There's yeah. not a single thing that is different about being shared. Yeah, so at that's this true. point, the people who have the access to wield that power either listen <laughs> and act or that's it and like mm -hmm. this whole I like the the last two years you know 2020 and now every organization has, has a, every space every person is taking like an anti-oppression 101 workshop and thinking that's it yes oh we mm -hmm. hired someone we, like that's it and that's not it if an no. individual isn't doing the daily work mm -hmm. doesn't matter what you did with your organization because yeah. guess what white supremacy has taught us how to perform things yeah <laughs> it's like it's so too much for sure and i think that's exactly it we need to all get on board with the idea that white supremacy and by extension all of these oppressive systems are a juggernaut that's kind of like it's just like a boulder that's rolling downhill that has its own momentum like mm -hmm. nobody needs to go out and try to be racist of a day or try to be homophobic <laughs> to keep that rolling right like those are the things that are happening it's like you have to push it in the opposite direction and make every day about thinking about what you can do from your location to push that boulder in the other direction right Right. I feel like, yeah, I feel like it's a mindset shift that needs to happen and needs to be like an all hands on deck mindset. And I think this is why coming back to intersectionality is so important, because if we looked at it that way, we would realize that dismantling the current system actually benefits most of us. Right. Like it's not like just black folks are going to benefit from dismantling oppressive systems right and it's everybody not most yeah. everybody yeah, yeah. It's everybody yeah like systems yeah. yeah yeah uh yeah and i mean it starts definitely in the education programs but also long before because the reality is people are grown by the time they're becoming doctors and nurses and things like that right like we're always looking now with like with our son the way that we parent how do we teach these ideas? Like he's kind of growing up identifying as a cis boy. We're continuously looking at ways in which we can disrupt toxic masculinity in our home. Mm -hmm. And boy, is that a job of work? Like that's another kind of boulder that's rolling downhill. We're like, it's continuous bombardment. And we are like, you know, it's like we have, we can't let up. We can't just be like, well, you know, we've talked about feminism a lot his whole life. It's been 10 years. He's probably good now. Like, <laughs> you know, like it's, we have to keep at it all the time. Ongoing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much for this conversation. And this even begin to touch on even, you know, a 10th percent of, of what could be talked about here in this little bit of time that we have. Um, before we, we end, is there any final things that you guys would like to say or to um, express before uh, we end this call? No, I don't, I don't have anything extra to say. I appreciate the opportunity to talk and kind of express um, our side of things. And um, as long as everyone keeps putting in the work and it's not mm -hmm. a course you're going to take, like, like Kira message mentioned, it's, uh, it's ongoing daily work that everyone needs to do. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, thank you again for, for this. Um, and I am sure that we will have another one of these discussions soon, um, because it is such an important uh, conversation to keep going. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. See you later.